Hi guys, so we are going to tackle chapter six today. Um, actually, the first half of chapter six, we've divided this chapter into two lectures and the next one will be next week and look at landscape effects on individual movement and dispersal. So, um, we know that animals move around a landscape to secure food, to locate suitable homes, nesting sites, to avoid unfavorable periods of the year, and to find mates. We are not going to talk as much about plant movement in this chapter, um, but of course plants also disperse to move away from parent stock and allow for them to colonize other areas. So there are principles that we'll touch on um, for plant movement and dispersal, but really this is focused more on animals. So animal orientation we know consists of two different phenomena. So the control of animals position in space and control of animals path through space. And so in order to do this, animals really have to have both a map and a compass. Um, to orient and move around the landscape. We can think of different types of movement and we'll discuss um, how those movements sort of scale as well following power law um, rules. So movements can be categorized on the basis of where and when they occur in space and time. We've got home range movements, um, dispersal movements, invasions, migration, homing, immigration, and can touch on each of those. Uh, movements can also be classified by the mechanisms um, of which the movements, by which the movements are achieved. So how does the organism orient? And we can think of the use of senses, vision, hearing, olfaction, navigation, and compass orientation that allow for that. So there are a variety of seemingly dis disparate topics in ecology dealing with foraging behavior, predation, dispersal, habitat selection, feed flow, and all of those are really dealing with the same phenomenon, and that is an individual's movement response to spatial heterogeneity. Um, but we are investigating the na nature by which this interaction happens at different scales um, relative to the behavior of interest. So another quote we pulled from the book is that individual fitness is the currency that links all types of movement. So we can think of an organism as constantly weighing the cost benefit of um, its movement through space. What's the reward and resources? what's the risk in potential predation, um, and just through even micro movements or large scale movements, a lot of times that is, that is the currency that's at play. There's some really interesting scaling relationships, um, <clears throat> allometric scaling relationships in landscape ecology that we can think about there's a relationship, of course, between body size and movement rate, and this uh, follows power law scaling. There are organisms that um, fall outside of this, such as, as birds that have just an inherent ability to move across a much broader landscapes. Um, so this relationship reflects the energetic constraints and requirements of body size, which place an upper limit on home range size. So we can think of the distribution of resources, which influences the energy acquisition and the pace of that, which then in turn influences the space use. So some of these space use requirements um, can determine a species dispersal range as well. Mammals with large home ranges disperse proportionally farther than those with smaller home ranges, and that's intuitive. Um, and then we do, when we look at birds as a standalone cohort, we see similar relationships between bird territory size and dispersal. Um, this 
foraging hierarchy that was discussed in the book, the elk is a great example of that. So foraging hierarchy for an elk encompasses patchiness that occurs at different scales of movement. So at the finest scale, foraging is influenced by the distribution of preferred grasses that they're going to select for as they're, um, as they're grazing. And that fine scale quality forage is often nested in a larger scale of plant community with patches, which are preferred uh, plant forage. As we move into the broader scale, foraging habitat is usually distributed unevenly, at least the highest quality foraging habitat is um, distributed unevenly across the landscape. But there may be other important habitat features that the elk are looking for, such as forest patches that can give them shelter from weather and predators. And then finally, we know that elk may track seasonally to take advantage of different uh, landscape conditions by moving up and down elevation with the seasons. So when we're thinking about an organism, we often have to think through we, and identify the perceptual grain and extent over which the species interacts with the environment. So these are usually determined um, behaviorally rather than perceptually. Um, just to pause on home ranges, then the concept of home ranges for a minute. <clears throat> so home ranges are the area around a home of an individual in which the normal activity of gathering food, mating, and caring for its young occurs. Home ranges can be linear, they can be two-dimensional, they can be three-dimensional. Um, home ranges are often correlated, again, with the animal size, carnivores having large home ranges, um, much larger home ranges than herbivores. Specialists may need to have larger home ranges than generalists. Um, polygamous species may have larger home ranges than monogamous species, and so forth. So species in marginal habitats need larger home ranges than those in high quality habitats. Um, and of course, a home range may decrease as the population increases. So there's some interesting factors at play, often behaviorally, um, resource-wise, mating system-wise, and even just based on population sizes that are gonna influence the animal's use in space and time. So under normal conditions, a lot of animals have permanent ranges. Some animals spend their entire life within these areas. We know that most frogs, salamanders, lizards, turtles, snakes, moles, woodchucks, deer mice, um, and others establish permanent home ranges. And these ranges are established after dispersing from their natal range. Um, but we've got migratory species like sea turtles and birds and elk that have two separate home ranges. They might have a summer home range where they reproduce and care for their young, and then they might have a winter range in a totally different area that allows them to survive um, adverse seasonal conditions. Uh, we know that ranges are often marked and defended, and we'll get into this a little more later, just the, the um, extent to which dominance hierarchies can influence an animal's space and time and where they, where they exist on the landscape. Um, and the home within the home range also serves as a refuge from en enemies and predators that may come in the form of an underground burrow, a cave, a tree cavity, a rotting log. It may be the most um, limiting factor for organisms as far as where they set up shop in a landscape. Um, and then just to pause on the behavior of territoriality, because this influences um, in, in a big way, 
the use of space. So some vertebrates actively defend a portion of their home range. This defended area is known as a territory and it contains the home on its site. Generally, an animal is considered to be ter territorial if it has exclusive use of an area. Um, the availability of food can influence territorial behavior and, um, and the size of the territory as well. The size of the territory may vary temporarily or from locality to locality. And territoriality is one of the most important behaviors affecting the organization of animal populations and population dynamics and, um, and the existence of, lands, of animals on the landscape. So the defended area is usually smaller um, than the actual home range, but in some species, they might be one in the same. And I've got a link to a video here <laughs> of a really elaborate um, territorial encounter between two African bullfrogs that's just kind of fun. Um, and then let's talk for a moment about dispersal and invasion. So dispersal refers to the movement of an animal from its birthplace. It's often um, a one-time movement. It usually favors either the male or the, or the female young. So it is the moment when animals move away from their parents. Um, this type of movement usually happens before sexual maturity and it takes place in pretty much all vertebrate groups. It tends to be the male um, of the species, but in some cases it favors females or both. So there are three important foundational reasons we see this behavior. Of course, it encourages outbreeding and genetic diversity within animal populations. It permits for range expansion um, as habitat conditions might improve in some places. And it may contribute even to reinvasion of formerly occupied areas. So in many species um, of vertebrate, dis vertebrates dispersal is density dependent. So there's a tendency to move only if the population is high or if aggression is shown from the parents. In other species, um, they seem to have an innate predisposition to travel away from the natal area. So a really amazing example of, um, of an invasion is when cattle egrets, which were native to Africa, crossed the South Atlantic on their own power and was first reported in South America in 1877. So that distance traveled was over open ocean, about 2,800 miles. It would have taken about 40 hours for this invasion to occur. And since then, we've seen um, the subsequent spread and redistribution of cattle egrets all the way through Central and um, North America. So the behavior of um, migration is the periodic movement of a population or part of a population from a region and their subsequent return to the same region. Um, the length of the trip can vary from species to species with some traveling in large groups and others traveling alone. We know migratory movements might be daily, they might be seasonal, they might be irregular depending on resource availability. They can occur annually as is the case with migratory um, birds and mammals and or they can require a lifetime to complete as is the case with salmon and freshwater eels. So um, short distance migration or local migration is typical of some salamanders that migrate from their hibernacula to their breeding ponds um, and mule deer. In the western mountains we see them moving from from summer ranges to north facing, facing slopes to wintering grounds on um, south facing slopes. We see species, as we already said, like elk doing um, latitudinal migration up and down 
elevation gradients. And we can see those both seasonally and daily as well. Um, and then altitudinal like migratory species face considerably fewer hazards and expend less energy than long distance migrants. So these shorter distance migrants. Um, and so survival behavior is high for those guys. Longer distance migration, we think of um, examples of this, many species of waterfowl, such as ducks and geese and swans and cranes are well known for their long distance migrations. Um, other passerine birds, songbirds, such as vireos, warblers, flycatchers, swallows, and thrushes also are long distance migrants. Um, of about 650 North American migratory bird species, 51% of them spend six to nine months in the tropics of the Americas. So a lot of migratory birds use major flyways in North America, including the Atlantic Flyway, um, the Mississippi Flyway, the Central Flyway, the Pacific Flyway. And since the flyway concept was established back in 1935, um, other studies show that species migrate over broad geographic areas, not just through narrow flyways. The width of those is actually quite expansive. Um, the distance of migratory journeys can be just incredible in both their length and their duration. We know that Pacific salmon breed in freshwater streams and their young migrate to the sea. After two to four years, they travel back to the river system in which they were born, and these fish will cover several thousand kilometers during their migratory travels. Um, eels spawn in the Sargosa Sea. The larva and immature class of eels move up in estuaries in the America and Europe, where they may spend eight to 25 years before they reach sexual maturity before returning back to their breeding areas. So there are um, several incredible examples of migration across huge expanses of ocean that, um, that we've seen in, in fish. And then of course, sea turtles, we've talked about a little bit already. One female sea turtle tagged with a satellite transmitter was tracked on a journey of over 4,900 miles, spanning almost two years before the battery ran out. Um, the natal breeding <coughs> of sea turtles says that while turtles may hatch in different regions and share common feeding grounds away from home, we know that animals leave um, in time to breed. They'll span hundreds of thousands of kilometers to go back to their natal birthplaces to, to breed once they reach sexual maturity. And we know that some of this behavior is possible um, because these organisms can are very sensitive to the magnetic field and can orient themselves in space and time. It's a difficult theory to test, but one that um, is pretty well established at this point. So this begs the question of how exactly do animals navigate in in space and time, and, and this and this ability is one that applies to the largest scale of moment, movement that we see in animals across, um, really globally, across the globe. We know that vertebrates have an incredible ability to orient themselves and that they likely use a bunch of different methods um, to do this. We know that they are able to use uh, the sense of taste and smell in order to orient themselves. They can um, use the sense of sight. They can recognize landmarks. Other species may use celestial bodies, a combination of um, a star map and sun compass. Other species um, use the Earth's magnetic field. So those mechanisms that allow species like salmon and birds to travel thousands of miles and um, come back to the same exact spots 
for, for nesting or um, breeding has been debated for a long time. And the consensus is that it is likely a combination of all of these um, olfactions, celestial cues, sound, vision, and the Earth's magnetic field that allow them to accomplish this. And it, they have found that um, magnetic iron oxide is concentrated in the head and the neck muscles of migratory, and in some cases, non-migratory birds. And it's thought that that iron base um, crystals may act like a tiny compass, actually sending signals to the brain and gives them the ability to gauge the strength and the direction of the magnetic field. So birds um, are thought to actually have three independent magnetic field detectors in their heads, one associated with the penile gland, one in the eye, which requires light in order to function, and a third um, transducer, which they're still figuring out how that works. So I wanted um, us to have a little more background on what influences movement of in individuals, organisms, and um, particularly vertebrate species, how that's accomplished, and now let's turn to some of these landscape ecology um, considerations for individual movement. So this figure gives a nice breakdown of, um, of patch dynamics and how an individual uh, may choose to, to move out of a patch, which we would term e-migration through the ma matrix and then into a patch. So we've got a list here of some of the attributes that we might choose to measure, um, and then some of the individual movement behaviors and um, factors that are going to influence when and why an organism chooses to, to move into a new patch. Uh, this slide gets into this concept of <clears throat> how much time does an organism choose to stay in a patch and what might be the reasons for moving on? We know that vertebrates engage in movement away from an occupied area. We call that e-migration. Um, and that decision is influenced by whether the benefit of leaving the patch actually outweighs the cost of staying there. And this is a concept, again, tied to fitness that uh, we don't necessarily think animals are consciously weighing, but, um, but it certainly is innately weighed for many species. So some of the measures that we see in landscape ecology <clears throat> that capture this concept of how much time to stay includes um, area restricted search metrics where we are able to identify by how animals move um, and resources are abundant. This concept of first passage time correlates to the movement speed and the distance, and it will draw inferences based on how quickly an animal is moving, how frequently it stops to forage, um, and it's able to correlate that with resource abundance. Residence time, again, um, is a measure of the amount of time spent in a spatially constrained area as a way of reflecting resource abundance. And so you can imagine that these are measures that we might get from animals that are, um, that are being tracked across the landscape. So it might be um, information that we're gathering remotely and not witnessing necessarily, or, or it might be um, from observation. And then some of the measures of when to leave that were discussed in the book. Um, marginal value theorem predicts that individuals should leave a resource patch when their net intake rate or acquisition of, of quality food resources drops to the overall average for that habitat. Um, the concept of giving up time is the amount of time spent correlates to the quality. Giving up density may reflect how foragers perceive a patch quality in terms of 
the resource availability and predation risk. Um, Clip Springer's perceive, perception of risk, as we saw in the book, uh, discusses how those, those organisms are constantly weighing um, food resource availability with its proximity to rocky outcroppings that are going to allow it to, um, to evade predators if a predator comes. And then exploitation competition and interference competition. We've already talked about the role that territoriality plays. And we know that leaving patches due to um, exhaustive resources or territorial behavior is, um, is often a huge driver. So we can see that territoriality intraspecifically, so between different species, but also intraspecifically within the same species. And then the concept of edge permeability. This is an animal's perception of a habitat boundary and their willingness to cross it. And we know that that's influenced um, by their physical ability to cross it, um, by physiological barriers that may prevent it from being able to cross it, and then also by psychological barriers that like they might be physically able to cross it, but, um, but have an innate predisposition not to cross certain barriers. So we look at uh, movement into that matrix. So movement across um, from one patch with hopefully the ability to move into another patch, we will refer to movement out of the patch into a matrix um, that's easily traversed as a soft edge and one that is rarely or never traversed as a hard edge. Book goes into a good bit of detail on this concept of edge permeability and whether or not an individual will move between patches. Uh, we know that may depend on um, that perception of the edge and the distance to the next patch and even their ability to detect um, other patches and just how dire the situation is in their current um, in their current patch are they being is there a huge incentive for them to move the book gives some really cool examples from studies in europe so whether or not individuals will move between patches may depend on their perception of the edge and the distance to the next patch, so a combination of those two. In this figure 6.12 um, in the book, it's from a fragmented landscape in Scotland. We saw that songbirds with, um, of different sizes, different species, were willing to cross different barriers so that the, what was available to, um, to a variety of species really changed depending on the proximity of the patch, their willingness to cross it. In this case, some were unwilling to cross any gap. In other cases, um, species were willing to cross gaps of a certain size, about 46 meters. We had a species willing to cross up to 60 meters, and then um, a couple of species with what much wider gap crossing abilities. So that perceptual range can be determined um, we think by multiple different senses. We know that some species detect um, patches with smell, and um, we have seen some interesting visual differences. For example, the white-footed mouse will move into a patch on moonlit nights, but would not do that on a moonless night. Um, and immigration, so moving into a new patch. We know that movement into patches um, requires habitat selection and that we refer to this concept of habitat selection as the disproportionate use to, of a habitat relative to its availability. Um, first order selection might be the, the geographic range of a species on a much larger scale. Second order selection determines location of the home range within that geographic range. Third order selection might be the dis disproportionate use of habitats within a home range. And then fourth order 
might be preferential movement among um, resource patches. So again, a really interesting parallel scaling relationship here in uh, how we can think of from the largest scale geographic range of species down to their selection of, of certain, certain um, food resources within their home ranges. Um, this concept of ideal free distribution is how individuals move among patches that differ in habitat quality. And this theory theorizes that individuals will distribute themselves in a way that maximizes their fitness. Um, the concept of ideal despotic distribution of individuals among patches that differ in habitat quality is, the, is that the distribution occurs um, in highly territorial species. And this distribution is driven really by relative competitive ability rather than the resource quality and availability. So understanding the behavioral um, standards for different species helps us understand how they're distributed in space. And then we also understand that there is such a thing as conspecific attraction, where the presence of individuals actually increases the likelihood of occupancy in more of those individuals in a space, which is a little bit of the opposite of territoriality. Um, we see these sorts of relationships of um, individuals in space when we know that individuals need to find mates. Um, the presence of uh, other individuals attracting some of their same species can be an indicator of habitat quality. Um, and then we also see cooperative behaviors. And I've got a link to a fun film here um, focused just on bird migration. It's one of my favorites. So if you hadn't seen it and have a little while to, to watch a fun migration movie, take some time.